Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we have Austin here from Fieldcraft Survival and we're gonna chat with you about medical stuff. So some of the things that you wanna be thinking about when you're planning your family camping trips or when you're going on your hikes. This video is really intended to be a launching off point. So just giving you a place to start and we're also gonna share some ways that you can get further information and places you can buy med kits and all that stuff that Fieldcraft provides. So I'm very, very excited to have Austin here because he has a lot of experience and I'm sure he's going to school us in some medical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I hope I can educate you in some way uh, for sure, but thanks for having me on. So um, my background, just a little bit about it. I spent time as a, a paramedic in the state of North Carolina and did that for a few years, joined the military, um, spent some time um, at the survival school for the Air Force. Um, and then moved into AFSOC and did some stuff with them. And now I'm with Fieldcraft Survival and I teach med, I teach survival. I'm actually the media director for the company as well. So uh, over the years, I've gained a lot of experience just from doing this in the back of an ambulance or in a helicopter up to now teaching it and having experiences with search and rescue here as an active member with the Sheriff's Department. So um, kind of what I wanna school you guys <laughs> up on is um, there's a ton of formal classes out there, you know, tons of certifications that people want to get and they get into the weeds and that, and it can seem intimidating and overwhelming. And what I don't want to do in this video is overwhelm anybody. Right. I want you guys to realize that um, medical considerations and preparation is something that everyone can do. There's a level of care that you can give um, that everyone can handle. So it's, it's important for us to do this. This is one of the, the staples of anything that's in my kit Anytime I go into the backcountry, I'm an avid outdoorsman. Uh, I spend probably almost as many nights in a sleeping bag as I do or used to uh, as I do in my bed. So, uh, but to start off with, I want you guys to understand that the one kit that you're probably going to use 90% of the time is what I like to call my boo boo kit. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is something that is great for the family. Um, you're going to have your band aids, gloves, triple antibiotic ointment just the basic little kits of, of things that are going to happen around camp. And it's actually really important that you do take these kits um, into the backcountry on your camping trips or hiking trips or whatever, because little nicks and cuts on your fingers and on your arms are really common. And what happens in the backcountry is the bacteria and the dirt and all those things get into those cuts and it can cause infection pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, and it's a good way to ruin a trip really fast. So yeah. um, taking, care, taking the time to take care of those little cuts by cleaning them with camp soap and clean water, fresh water that you've either treated or you've brought with you out there um, is really, really important to do. So I, I can't stress that one enough. Yeah. Um, absolutely take the time to clean and, and doctor up those little cuts, especially if you got kids running around. It's it's inevitable, right? Yeah. The skin, knees and everything. Yeah. Um, but moving from that, where we look more into the emergency preparedness side of things where uh, an event has happened and now we're responding to it, uh, anticipating worse injuries. The first thing that you guys need to think about is the assessment. Um, I, I can't give you everything in this one video on an assessment, but what I want you guys to, to focus on is whenever you approach the person, maybe it's a loved one or someone you don't even know, uh, the victim or the patient, uh, I want you guys to one, first make sure that that scene, that area is safe for you to even go into. Um, if it was an animal a, a attack or a bite, is that animal still around? I don't want to go in there and then get hurt myself, then I'm no help to anyone. So making sure it's safe, uh, checking the environment around you and making sure that's safe as well before you even approach. Uh, and then when you do approach, trying to talk to them. And one, if it's someone that you don't know, gain consent if they are conscious. If they are unconscious, you have what's called implied consent, that anyone in their right mind and in the correct state of mind, if they are unconscious, you do have that consent from them if they're uh, unconscious. So approach them, make sure it's safe, and then start sweeping for blood. Um, that's the, called the first thing is the blood sweep. So you're gonna check the body systematically starting at the head, working down the body and seeing if you notice any what we would call massive hemorrhage. And massive hemorrhage can be defined as a lot of different things. The way that I like to define it is bleeding that I cannot get to stop with direct pressure. Um, you may hear it called um, bright red squirting blood. Um, unfortunately, in the, in the reality, it sounds good, briefs well, looks good on paper. The reality of a situation is we're all wearing clothing and clothing does a really good job of masking cuts, masking uh, lacerations, things like that. It does a really good job of absorbing the blood. And then if somebody's laying out on the dirt and that blood is leaking onto the ground, the dirt will absorb that just like it does rain. So you might not see this huge pool of blood like you see in a movie or whatever else. So actually assessing it with your hands and checking your hands, preferably gloved hands if I can, 
um, is going to be a really good idea. So, uh, and then what to do once I find that bleeding. So if I come to an arm and I haven't even done the rest of the body, I'm going to address that first. So that means exposing the wound. If that means I got to tear open a shirt or cut open a shirt or whatever. I need to expose it, look at the wound and see if it classifies as massive hemorrhage. Uh, it could be bright red scoring blood or just any bleeding that I can't get to stop. And then there is a, a, a protocol for applying a tourniquet to stop that bleeding. And I'll get into that in just a second. Something else that's really common uh, or within the assessment, a lot of people will, will find what's called a distracting injury. Uh, maybe it's a really badly broken bone uh, and it is causing the, the, the patient a lot of pain or maybe it's some kind of what we call a distracting injury, you know? And so um, don't let those things be a distraction. Understand that it's, if it's not life-threatening, I need to pay attention to that bleeding and address that first and then move on. Yeah, I was gonna say, sometimes people, when they have a distracting injury, they don't even realize that they're bleeding out in another Correct. area. Yeah. So like, yeah, that's an important thing to like, for you not to get distracted by that. Right, absolutely. And it, it happens to even trained professionals. You know, you see something that's, that really catches your attention that might be a uh, gross movement anatomy and in, in a bone or something like that. Yeah. And you want to address that first because you, it catches your eye, but mm -hmm. uh, you need to pay attention to that life-threatening bleeding first, okay? And then uh, to address that, I actually use, so this is the kit that I carry um, uh, in the back country. A little visitor here, a little spider. <laughs> the Hunter Med Kit from Fieldcraft Survival. We designed this specifically for folks like us to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. out in the woods. So, um, but to address that, we actually carry, or I carry a tourniquet. So, um, and I would definitely suggest if nothing else, that's something that you guys should absolutely carry. Uh, and I just briefly will go over uh, a few things with the tourniquet. This is just a, a Gen 7 cat tourniquet uh, made by North American Rescue. And we do a ton of content with the, with the tourniquet on our channel. So um, I'll give you something brief now, but feel free to head over and check that out later. Um, but you have a few basic parts to this tourniquet that'll open up. And then if I'm gonna apply this, I just wanna make sure that I'm doing it correctly. And I, I need to practice this in, in my downtime. So what I wanna do is, if this is my leg, I wanna make sure that there's nothing in my pockets that's gonna uh, cause any type of uh, uh, a bulge that isn't gonna allow the tourniquet to seat very well. So when, I, when it comes to applying a tourniquet, I wanna make sure that I apply the tourniquet as high and as tight on the limb as I can. Um, that's kind of the saying to go by as high and tight. Um, and just always remember that and you'll never go wrong when it comes to tourniquet placement. Um, what I wanna do is have uh, kind of the setup I have here with my hands. I wanna be able to rotate the buckle to the inside if, uh, if I can so I can protect it from being on the outside of the body that could be uh, running into debris or, or getting moved around much easier than protected on the inside. Uh, I'm gonna take the running end, run it in through my buckle, and then I will cinch this part down as tight as I can starting the Velcro and connecting as much of the Velcro as I can all the way around. And again, you can see that this buckle is kind of to the inside of my leg. It's protected from the outside. And that first bit of tightening is where you kind of make your money with the tourniquet. I should almost be cutting off the circulation or completely cutting off the circulation before even turning what's called the windlass. From here, I'm going to take the windlass, which is this piece here, and I'll start twisting it. And just for training, you know, that's one, one twist. And I can put that in and I'm already feeling the blood supply to the rest of my leg um, going away. So my leg's getting numb, it's starting to tingle. And it's actually pretty painful even just training with this, but it is an important aspect of training in general is knowing what it feels like to apply, uh, to apply it to yourself, to apply it to someone else and know that it's done correctly. I'll ask people in a class, um, how many times do you turn it? And a lot of people will say two times or three times or until I can't turn it anymore. Well, if you can't turn it anymore, good but I'm gonna turn it until the bleeding stops. Okay. Uh, I'm only using these tourniquets on a limb, somewhere where I can put it, and then I'm gonna turn the windlass until the bleeding completely stops, or I can't turn it anymore. After I have the windlass in place within the windlass retention clips here, I'll take the Velcro timestamp, I'll stretch it over. If I have a Sharpie handy, I will mark the time that I apply the tourniquet. If not, I'll just stre uh, stretch it across, apply it to retain the windlass so it can't just come out. And if I need another one because it's still bleeding, I can apply a second tourniquet and I want to butt it up right up next to this one. Okay. okay. So getting it on uh, quickly and, and you have to practice with these. Um, it's, it's one of those things that you just need to get lots of reps on and, and, yeah. and practice. 
So that's the basic application of a tourniquet. Again, there's a lot of steps and a lot of, I'd really love to go over the nomenclature of the tourniquet and a few other things, but it's a lot to try to go over in just one video. But yeah. the other thing to carry is this is a, a kit that we make at Fieldcraft Survival. It's called the BHRK, the Basic Hemorrhage Response Kit. Um, it gives you the ability to pack wounds and to dress wounds uh, that aren't massive hemorrhage, but are still injuries that need to be addressed. So um, having those, and again, it's it, it takes training, it takes repetition, it takes practice. So pick up a kit. You can even get training kits to where you can uh, use the gear over and over so you can practice with it at home. Uh, but really important to have. Yeah, I would say like the practice part is really important. I think a lot of people take a med kit, but they don't know where things are mm -hmm. in the med kit or how to use the things that are in there. Yeah. And so I think like repetition frequently is important. And like I've taken courses on this kind of stuff, but like if I'm not practicing it regularly, I totally forget yeah. it. It's absolutely perishable. And, yeah. Um, you know, the other thing with that is a lot of folks will say, well, I'm not going to take this med kit or I'm not going to spend a couple hundred dollars on a med kit because I don't know how to use everything in it. Um, I would encourage you to, even if you do purchase a really good kit, go ahead and purchase it and carry it with you. Make it reasonably sized and carrying the right equipment. But even if you don't know how to use everything in it, imagine if I'm the guy that pulls up to a car accident or to your fall or whatever emergency that you could be having. Um, even if not in a professional capacity, just as another hiker uh, or lay citizen, I know how to use that equipment and can use your equipment to help you. So an, uh, another reason yeah. I would encourage people to carry a kit. So yeah. next up, an, another really common injury that you get. <laughs> man, flies like crazy. Man. Another really in common injury that you get in the backcountry, and I see it a lot in search and rescue, is which is a reason a lot of people call us is fractures uh, or even just twisted ankles. You know, we've all been on the trail, rolled an ankle on a rock or whatever. Um, depending on the severity of that, you may need to splint that, and then you have to start thinking of considerations of well, how am I going to get out of here? Do I need to make crutches? Do I need to make a gurney? Do I need to wait on EMS to get here? Or do I need to try, is this bad enough? I need to try to get them back to a vehicle or what have you. So, yeah. um, but I do want to go over a few just simple ways to splint some things with you. And this is just called a SAM splint. This is the second version. Um, they come in a couple of different colors. You, you can get them in this OD green color, uh, which is really common for law enforcement, military. There is absolutely no difference in the kit. It's just the color scheme. Um, the civilian variant is blue and orange. So that way it's more visible. I, I am a fan, and even with the tourniquets, I'm a fan of using the orange colored tourniquet because I do want something bright. If I have a tourniquet on, I want EMS and people to see it. The, the, the darker OD green or black colored medical items, like I said, law enforcement EMS, guys that are in environments where they might not want bright colors showing versus as a civilian, I, I'm gonna look for those brighter colors. Yeah, I think I have an orange one, like a yeah, bright. I would, <laughs> and, and the same with a blue, you might see blue ones and those are used for training, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still the same piece of equipment and still works just as good. With the SAM splint, this is one of my favorite items to carry. It weighs absolutely nothing. You can see its signature, it's not very big. You can pack it away really easily, uh, but there's several uses, not besides just splinting an injury. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of survival cool things you can do. You can, underneath this, it's just this foam padding with a little piece of thin aluminum that allows me to manipulate this and shape it differently. Um, I can do some cool stuff with this though. I can peel the, uh, uh, the padding off and polish it up a little bit, make it a signal mirror. I can turn it into a little bowl and actually boil water in it. Tons of cool things you can do that with this. That could be a this. whole other video. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, tons of cool stuff. That's why I like to carry them as well as for, for splinting. But um, I'll go ahead and break this open and, and show you guys how to do a little bit of splinting. So the first thing I would do is you can kind of see how I'm positioned. My left knee's down, my right knee's up. Then I have Amanda's leg on my knee, which gives me a good working space, uh, which is just here, it's close. Um, it's probably going to be more comfortable for your patient and then you want to start that elevating process. Now, um, this is assuming that the sprain or the break is still in anatomically correct position, meaning that the ankle is not twisted in some kind of a, uh, uh, an odd angle, uh, which does change the consideration a little bit. So if it was, I probably wouldn't do this. I would leave the ankle in the position that it is on the ground and then stabilize from there. Uh, but the most common are these simple sprains that can, you probably don't even know it's broken until you get to the hospital, but that are already in this anatomically correct position. So what I would do is open up my SAM splint. I would shape it to the shape of the foot on the opposite foot, the one that's not injured. So that way I'm not twisting and bending this around on an injured ankle. And then I would take this. I like to take the splint, run it across the bottom of the boot. I do leave the boot on. Um, which allows for more support of the ankle. Once I have this on underneath the foot, I have a little bit of the heel sticking out. And then from here, I'll just maintain 
like a little bit of control over the leg and let it come back down and then rest. And then once I have this up here, all I need are two triangular bandages, which allow me to just secure this in, in place. With this still in place, all I'm gonna do is take my triangular bandage. I'll run one down by the ankle, lining this Sam splint up as best as I can. I might even ask Amanda if she can just to hold this. Um, use my patient to help me a little bit. Leaving this rolled up, instead of tying the knot directly over the top, I don't wanna put the uh, bandage directly over the injury but I will offset it just a little bit above or below. So all I'm doing is gonna tie a simple square knot, which is left over right, and get it pretty snug. Not so tight that I'm cutting off circulation, but snug enough to actually immobilize the injury. And then I'll go right over left. And then with that one, all I'll do is take the excess, run it right here, and just kind of wedge it in there. All right, and so for the next one, again, just open up my triangular bandage, run it underneath, and then I wanna make sure that my SAM splint is on the leg appropriately, keeping the leg in an anatomically correct position, just meaning it's normal position as best I can. And then again, just a little square knot off to the side, snug, but not so tight that it's cutting off circulation. Left over right, right over left. Tying that off and then tucking the excess to the inside. Uh, a few things that you may consider with doing the splint is padding the inside of the splint prior to putting the splint on. Um, or padding even the outside to protect and immobilize it even more uh, just for the transport out. Obviously arms or a leg or what have you may be a little different. Um, the thing about splinting is as long as you're supporting the bone or the joint that's injured, you really can't go wrong as long as you're securing it tightly enough. So uh, that's kind of the simplicity behind splinting. Another really common injury at the campsite is burns. We've all done it. You reach and you grab a pan off the fire and you know burn your hand or um, god forbid fall into a, a flame or something uh it happens right it's just yeah. one of those really common accidents that i've seen a lot in the back country boiling so, water is another boiling one water absolutely food anything like that it happens and it's unfortunate and it's painful but fortunately you can carry things like like burn tech which uh, is essentially just a type of bandage that has an ointment already built in to help keep the burn moist which is what's most imp important when it comes to burns uh, burn tech weighs nothing packs down just in this little kit uh, you can fold them up there's no real crazy considerations with it you just simply open it place it on the burn uh, if you don't have something like this I'm not a huge fan of just using like a normal cotton gauze you don't ever want to put a dry dressing on a burn um, because I, what happens when when you get a burn whether it's just a surface burn or it's a really really bad like second or third degree burn what will happen if you put a dry dressing is all that moisture is going to be surging to that location of the injury mm -hmm. and it'll actually can can kind of sink its way into that burn yeah. and it uh it gets kind of messy and it's just not what you want to do so you want to keep it moist if you do have some a way to get some good clean water um, and keep a, a dressing moist on the burn is a good is a good play uh, but the burn dressing is really the best way um, but you need to know when it's bad enough that you need to leave and get get help uh, if it's something small uh, we look at like the palm of your hand um, including your fingers is about one percent um, so you've probably heard like you know, maybe a 50% of the body or whatever, and it's determined by the palm. Um, so if it's 1% or smaller, maybe two, depending on where it is, I'd say you're probably good just dressing it yourself, uh, enjoying the rest of your weekend, especially if it's a first or second degree burn, like a little contact burn or a sunburn, something like that. But now if you're looking at, you spill a bunch of boiling water, you're, you're starting to get blisters or even worse, like a third degree burn or something, you absolutely need to go ahead and keep that person hydrated keep the, the dressing that's on there moist, um, start treating for shock and, and get them out of there. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of ways that that can go wrong for you. And you wanna uh, also, if you do have any burns to the arms, anything like that, you do wanna remove jewelry that's distal, that's further away from that burn. So like if I had a burn up on my arm here, if I was wearing any rings, a bracelet, my watch, things like that, I wanna go ahead and take those off. And especially if it's near the burn because it can get kind of move into that burned area and then typically the limb will start to swell a little bit as well so you want to pay attention to those things so um, pretty simple thing to take care of especially when they're minor when they're small but just go with a little burn tech and you'll be set aside from burns another really common injury that's unfortunate in the back country are eye injuries um, we've all been on the receiving end and probably the giving end of 
Um, I'm walking through a bunch of trees. I push a branch, I let it go, and it smacks the person in the face behind you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've been popped in the eye a couple of times. Uh, it, it's uncomfortable. Mostly, it's usually not an actual injury. Usually, it'll pop you in the eye. It'll water up a little bit, which is the body's natural way of trying to flush anything that's in there out. Um, but you sometimes can get debris in your eye. And what you need to do is just keep that eye closed. Don't try to um, fish it out with just your finger. But what you can do, turn the person up, and then you want to rinse the eye um, from the inside out. You don't want to rinse like this way, uh, because if you do push that debris out, you could push it right into the other eye, mm -hmm. uh, which would not be fun. And there's just more of the, the tear duct is on the inside part of the eye, which it can kind of get stuck. Debris can get more stuck there. Mm -hmm. So you want to flush it out uh, to the outside of the body. Um, and then sometimes even after the debris is out, you may notice a lot of pain or itching in the eye, which means that you could have scratched it. Now, if that, um, if that feeling lasts longer than I'd say probably 15 to 20 minutes, you're gonna wanna go ahead and probably go get that looked at because you could have an injury to the eye that they can take care of if it's seen sooner than later. Um, if you do have something more severe, like, um, so, like something is protruding from the eye, uh, which is kind of a worst case scenario, uh, but it does happen, you wanna stabilize that. Similar to how we splint, um, you wanna kind of splint that in place with maybe a, a small t-shirt or even the sleeve off of a t-shirt. And you wanna always cover and close the other eye. Because, I mean, maybe some people can move their eyes individually, but most of us, um, when you look one way or the other, both eyes go, right. and you can't typically control that. So uh, you always want to cover the other one, because if not, they're going to want to be trying to look around, and it can be moving that around, and you don't want to cause further damage. Um, in these med kits, and on fuelcraftsurvival.com, we sell these just little eye cups, which is a great little tool that allows you to put this over the eye. You can even use a second one if need be, but you can put this over to protect the eye and then just bandage it right around the head, really easy. So just pay attention to that. And if that injury or burning sensation lasts longer than 20, 30 minutes, uh, then it might be worth looking for debris, trying to flush it out. And then if you still can't get anything, just go ahead and get it looked at. You mentioned like, um, you know, a puncture, like something stuck in the eye. Mm -hmm. It would apply to like if you get like a branch stuck in your abs, like you yeah. want to leave, leave that there. Correct. Like kind of stabilize it there. Like you don't pull that stuff no, out. No, you want to, yeah. you want to leave anything that protrudes into the body there, brace it where it's at and then move out and, and try to uh, allow that person to not have to move a whole lot because uh, you don't want to be turning and moving the muscles and things like that. That could be causing further damage. Um, there are some instances where uh, maybe somebody falls onto something and it's protruding into their body and they're, you know, if you don't take it out, then you can't move them um, or you, you need to break that off, cut it off mm -hmm. and take it with them still stuck. Um, if that was the case, if you can get signal and you can get help to you and let the professionals do that, I would absolutely suggest yeah. that. Um, if you're really in dire straits and you know that you have no other option, um, then you have to do what you have to do. But professionally, I would definitely tell you, leave something in, stabilize it where, it, where it's at, and then get them out of there or bring help to you. So um, those are really the most common things. And another thing is, is falls, you know, uh, with a fall and EMS, you know, there's people that fall down, you can get hurt, you can even break bones just falling from the height that you're at. But something that we looked at is falls from greater than 10 feet, um, just because there's so much momentum that happens and it can be such a more significant what we would call a mechanism of injury uh, meaning there's just so much force there that it can cause other injuries and even injuries that you can't see so kiddos climbing the tree falls from somewhere higher than 10 feet even if he hits the ground pops right up and seems to be okay totally uh, would suggest just go ahead uh, and, and go in and get looked at because there are just so many things that can happen internally that you don't even realize are wrong until later and then sometimes it can be um, it puts you in a much worse circumstance versus had you just gone and gotten looked at to begin with. So those are a lot of the most common injuries that I've seen in the back country, um, just in search and rescue and, and spending time out in myself and injuries I've even dealt with on my own. So obviously there's a slew of other what ifs and, and things that could happen, but I would say that these are really common and I would encourage everyone to go, go get trained, go to a first aid CPR class um, and then you know, that's kind of the starting point, but you can take that training as far as you want, even as, as a civilian, you know, it, it, people think, oh, I have to be working in an ambulance to get that kind of training, and that's just not the case. You know, there's a ton of great training out there. Um, we train at Fieldcraft Survival all the time. We do Wednesday free seminars on this stuff all the time. So um, you guys feel free to train with us or look up other places local to where you are. I've taken some of their training and like, 
I can say that training and just being as prepared as possible is gonna allow you to handle these situations that none of us want to handle but that might occur and it will also make you more confident when you go out camping and when you go hiking like you want to be confident in your abilities and the gear that you're packing and that you know how to use it so this is like i said in the beginning really just a launching off point hopefully it's gotten you curious and excited for some more training and check the description box below because i will have all the links to where you can find more information about fieldcraft get some of that training get some of these med kits that we've been showing you and hopefully just feel more confident as you head out into the woods so thank you austin so yeah, much for you. being here we're going to do a lot more with austin so make sure to give the video a like comment below with some of the videos you want to see and subscribe to the channel i'll see you in the next one